Hey friends, welcome to another virtual D8 Youth Workshop. Hi, I'm Terry Fender, your ARBA District 8 Director. I wanna thank everybody for joining us again this evening. And throughout the presentation, please uh, chime in uh, with your location. You know, we love to see uh, where our visit for our viewers are from and also chime in with any questions. And toward the end of the presentation, Amanda back at our control board, will read those off to Roger and you'll get an answer. So uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Judge Roger Hassenflug from Oregon. He's not only a judge, a past district director, and he was also on the ARBA Standards Committee when the current, or I should say the new, the current standard was uh, released. So we went right to the source. With that, Roger, it's all yours. There, I have to unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> Are we good? I see you. Okay, so we can pull up the presentation as you wish and we'll go from there. My background, by the way, is uh, the convention in Indianapolis. So, here we are, we're gonna talk about the changes um, to the current standard of perfection. Uh, the standard's produced every five years. Uh, it has a five-year life. So this one's gonna be into, in effect until January uh, 1st, 2026. Yeah, 2026, that's amazing to be able to say that these days. And I just wanna give a shout out here to the artwork. Amanda Olson created this uh, cover. The back cover of the standard is a KV in the same kind of arrangement. And it's just, uh, I think this is the, I don't know, eighth or ninth standard that uh, I've seen come out since I started raising rabbits. And this is just the most spectacular uh, uh, cover that I've seen to date. So let's uh, cruise on to the next slide. A um, Couple of caveats. One is I'm not the official spokesperson for the ARBA or the ARBA Standards Committee. And um, the official information that you can get on standard changes uh, can be found on the ARBA website, as well as articles and posts uh, by the ARBA Standards Committee Chair, and that's Bryony Smith. Uh, she posts those uh, on Facebook on the Judges and Registrar's official page. And uh, she's also doing a great job of getting information on the ARBA website. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge some folks that uh, gave me information and pictures and stuff like that for this presentation. Uh, Kathy Shoulder put together the summary of changes from the, uh, for, for the current um, uh, SOP from the last, so that was really helpful. Uh, Bryony Smith was very helpful in, in uh, letting me in on some of the, the errors that occurred in the first printing of the standards, so I'll be able to share some of those with you. And then, of course, just comparing the, the old standard to the new standard my own notes from the standing committee chair and uh, Sandra White and her ARBA photography committee um, shared some photos with me. So I uh, just want to acknowledge those folks. I appreciate their help. Next, um, I, I want to start off with a thought about um, the standard. I said at the very beginning that it has a five year life, so it lives for five years. And I think in the first few months of every standard, um, the same thing happens. And that is judges and uh, folks who are showing rabbits begin to use the standard. They discover some, some typical, generally speaking, a small number of errors that have uh, occurred in the standard. It might be a word substitution, might be a wrong weight uh, that gets printed for a breed, uh, something like that. Uh, we're gonna point some of those out uh, it's very possible that not all of those have been discovered yet, since we're not having a whole lot of shows. The other thing I, I wanted to say is that there are always intended changes uh, when the standard uh, is put out, but sometimes there are unintended consequences of those. And typically in the first year to the first three years of the standard, um, we discover some of those unintended consequences and whether or not the intended consequences achieved uh, what we hope they would achieve or whether they didn't achieve what we hope they would achieve. And so that is kind of the source of the list of things that gets um, addressed in the next standard as we go down the road. And um, in terms of those changes, whether they're good or bad, 
and those unintended consequences, the arbiter of all that is always time. So just, it's gonna take us a little while to figure out whether the changes are great and really help the breeds or, or whether they're not. And I also wanted to let you know how many people are involved in putting together a standard like this. Um, you've got the ARBA board and standards committee, you've got breed club boards standard and their standards committees. Uh, you've got ARBA staff and publication help. And by the time you count all those people up, you're talking about well over 200 people. Uh, we've currently got 50 breeds uh, that we're addressing, well over 300 pages of material between rabbits and cavies. And most of that work is processed by volunteers. So uh, that there would be some miscommunication or some errors that would occur in the course of producing standards is really not very surprising. Uh, when you consider how many people are involved in putting it together. Uh, what is what is surprising is how little miscommunication and how few errors. And I think that's a, really a tribute to all of the people uh, that have a hand in putting together these standards. Uh, but be patient, uh, please, uh, with the new standard uh, over time. We'll see uh, if all the changes uh, work out. Next slide. Um, I'm going to separate the standard into three sections, and uh, the first one will be the front end. I'll talk about that uh, a bit. That's the first 62 pages of it. Uh, the second section, I'm going to spend some time on rabbit breed standards, so individual breed standards. And then the third section is a KV section, and I understand that Mary Lou Eisel is going to do a presentation just like this on the KV section, uh, and that's the, the third section of it. Um, if you want to see some of those KV changes before that, um, and if you're a member of the American KV Breeders Association, you can find that in our most recent issue of the Journal of the American KV Breeders Association on pages 29 and 33. Mary Lou and uh, uh, Jim Hupp uh, collaborated on an article addressing the standard. Um, if you're not a member, you can borrow one from a friend. It's a great publication, by the way. So we're going to look at the first two sections and uh, start with the front end. So uh, These are the things that comprise the front end. There's a, a lot of material in there. If you're new to rabbits, um, there are showing and judging aids. Um, some of the terminology that's used with rabbits and cavies is unique to rabbits and cavies. Uh, you won't find them in a standard uh, dictionary. So we've got a glossary that addresses that. And there are standards that don't fit in the breed standards uh, uh, here uh, in this front end to the commercial standard, the, the meat pens. General disqualifications that apply to all the breeds um, and uh, procedures for changing a standard and admitting new breeds and so forth. So all of that stuff's in the front end. A lot of colored pictures. I know the committee has time. One of the complaints always about standards is, gosh, I wish the pictures were better. Uh, we spent a lot of time with this standard uh, going over pictures and choosing pictures. And I think there's a, a lot of improvement in the pictures that you'll see in the standard this time. But we're always, you know, at the mercy of pictures that are available. So um, feel free to take pictures and submit them to the ARBA uh, Photography Committee uh, for the next standard. Um, not all of the front end sections were changed. I'm just gonna focus on the ones that were changed. So uh, the next slide, I think we're gonna tell you about the ones that weren't changed much. And um, those are them, <coughs> excuse me, it's my understanding that you're gonna have uh, access to this video afterwards. So you'll be able to come back and read all those. I won't read every slide to you. Uh, but those things um, didn't change. So if you're uh, involved in youth contests or what have you, and uh, some of the questions might come out of those sections of the standard, um, this is something you don't have to uh, spend a whole lot of time on if you already know it from the prior standard. Now let's look at the next slide. First, we're going to look at the glossary. And we're going to start with some new terms that were introduced. This is the my understanding, the total of the new terms that were introduced to the glossary. Bib is specific to the lionhead breed. Uh, they introduced that word to describe chest wool. So there's a description of the bib, bib in the um, lionhead uh, standard or a reference to it. A booted broken, that's something we hadn't talked about a whole lot, I don't think, before, hadn't had a definition of. We needed that because now there's a universal broken disqualification that applies to all breeds. 
and um, you disqualify a rabbit that is a booted broken. And we're gonna talk more about that later and have a picture that kind of gives you a sense of what that looks like. There are a number of judges that love the word chuffy. Uh, it's never really been defined in the glossary before. So um, it's now defined, it's that a little excessive fat around the shoulders and, and the rib section of the rabbit. I suspect that if you're involved uh, either as a, a judge of youth contests or a participant in youth contests, that you're gonna uh, run across the word entropian quite a bit. It's a new word. Um, the brief definition of it's here. You should read the whole definition of it in the glossary. But uh, it's an odd enough word that I have a suspicion it's gonna creep into a lot of youth contests. And then pastern is an ankle. Pitted coats, uh, um, kind of a comment about Rex rabbits that have been, been around for a long time. It's kind of surprising that it wasn't defined before. Uh, same with rangy, I was shocked that there wasn't a definition of rangy in the glossary prior. And then stifle, uh, we introduced the word stifle or defined the word stifle in the glossary because the Jersey woolly uh, breed um, defines its top line or its peak point uh, is peaking at the stifle. And so we felt like we needed a definition of what that was. Um, all of the terms, the new terms and the revised terms that we're gonna look at here in just a minute, um, they have to do with uh, medical issues. Those terms were all reviewed by Dr. Jay Haraz. He's a, a practicing veterinarian, a rabbit breeder, a former ARBA director. And Jay took a look at um, all of the terms that have to do with uh, medical issues and kind of approved the language that uh, was used or revised for those definitions. Uh, next slide. Um, these uh, terms were revised. I don't have a quick definition of them beside them for you, but it, again, if you're involved in youth contests, either as a judge or as a participant, I encourage you to go look at the definitions, the changed definitions, slightly changed definitions in most cases of these words because they're, uh, they're a little bit different than last time. And uh, you could get tripped up in those contests if, uh, if you're uh, giving the old definition. So the third and final slide for glossary would be this one. Um, there are a number of terms that were either combined or they were replaced by other terms, or they were simply dropped from the glossary altogether, either because they were redundant or because they're normal dictionary terms or just because they're so uh, unused at this point in time that it just didn't make sense that we bothered the, uh, to have the space in the standard form. There were also some combined terms. Um, buck and wolf teeth, uh, that, that's going to fall under malocclusion now. Ear canker disappeared. You're going to find that definition under ear mites. You'll find a definition for, for peg teeth, but not pegged teeth, which is interesting. Uh, peg teeth is um, butted teeth. There's simply, a, it's simple malocclusion. Under fur, I uh, can't remember the last time I heard any judges talk about under fur, the, the common terminology these days is undercoat. That's the common use. So undercoat replaces under fur. And again, the same is true for Walla, Nunai, Ridetail, etc. Now some of the um, terms were combined. So we used to have separate definitions, for example, for flesh spot and freckle, you'll find those uh, definitions combined in one definition now. And alphabetically, you'll find them under flesh spot. And then some terms were just dropped and I've got a list of them there. Uh, and again, they're either terms that are in disuse at this time, or they're just normal uh, dictionary terms that are in, have pretty common, uh, common understanding. So uh, next slide. Um, this um, part of the standard presenting uh, new breeds, varieties, and groups uh, to the ARBA Standard Committee pertains uh, mostly to folks who are either presenting a new breed group or variety, or if you're on a breed club board of directors, especially if you're the president or the secretary of that uh, breed club, or if you're on a standards committee for a breed club, um, this section very definitely applies to you. If you're a presenter or 
uh, on a board or a standard committee for a breed club, you really need to read this section of the standard. It's significantly changed. There are major changes in it. There's a single uniform process. Um, working standards can now be published on the website. Um, that's a practice that started uh, probably two or three years ago um, under the previous board uh, as when Josh was a president, the board approved uh, publishing um, standards for new breeds and stuff on the website. And what that means is that you can show them sooner. So uh, instead of waiting for the January, February domestic rabbit publication, and, you know, your first opportunity is in February of the, the year following the uh, ARBA convention. Uh, now, if the convention's in October, you might be able to show that new breed of variety or that uh, new COD that's got a working standard uh, in November. Um, you know, pretty quickly after they're presented. There are now set dates in the in this uh, process. Uh, the, um, a lot of the deadlines were floating dates in the previous uh, process, and it was pretty confusing. So if a convention was in, the, say, the first part of October, you had to count backwards 90 days to figure out when certain things were due. If it was the first of November, you had to count backwards from that date uh, to figure out when things were due. So um, that harmed some presentations and there were presenters that were um, missing deadlines. And so um, now there are set dates, so it's much easier to figure out. There's also a lot of clarification around breed club and breed standard committee responsibilities uh, with regard to new varieties and groups. Um, every type of presentation now, uh, if it's good enough, can pass in two years. Uh, there were four types of presentations previously, all had separate uh, processes with different requirements, and some of them could pass in two years and some of them couldn't. Now, every type of presentation could pass in two years if they meet the criteria. Uh, reduction and simplification in general rules, and there's a graphic timeline for visual learners, so you can kind of, it's a quick reference guide, you can take a look at that. Um, and figure out when certain things are due and how the process works. Kind of get a bigger picture of the, the whole process by looking at that visual. Um, the thing that's gonna most affect judges, if there are judges listening uh, today, is um, that the number of official working standards is expected to increase. Um, in the previous process, um, some of the um, presentations of new groups or varieties had to wait until they were presented for the first time to the ARBA standard committee before you could show them. And now you can show them as soon as you get a, um, a working standard approved by the committee and that could happen uh, within 90 days after applying for a certificate of development. So we're gonna have working standards that come into um, effect literally all throughout the year. There was a lot of discussion about that process. Um, with the standard committee and the argument against doing that is that you know you're going to have a lot of standards for judges to to um to have to uh, manage um the argument for doing it is that it allows presenters to um, show the rabbits and, and develop some excitement around their new breed or their new variety do some marketing in effect and create some kind of excitement get, get people kind of wound up about them and, uh, and I think ultimately that's good for the ARBA. And, and if you put on shows, I think the advantage uh, to this change is that you, you're very likely to have more paid entries at your show. And uh, that makes it a little easier to, to afford buildings and hire judges and stuff. So uh, we'll see how it works. Um, time is always the arbiter of change. So uh, next slide. There's also a process for changing an existing breed standard. And again, this doesn't apply if you're just showing your rabbits uh, and you know, you're not involved in a, in a new, um, uh, new uh, variety or group. But for those people who are, and that would be the presenters, the club, well, I'm sorry, this is not a new variety. This is changing an existing standard. So it's really the club breed officers and the breed uh, standard committee uh, members that really need to, um, to, to focus on this, this process. And I'm not gonna read all that stuff to you. Again, you can take a look at the slide if this pertains to you. But the one thing I do wanna say 
is that if you are a club officer or a breed standard committee member, you wanna start the process a lot earlier than um, the deadlines that are in the constitution and bylaws for the ARBA. If you wait, if the club waits and just barely meets those deadlines and you submit a change to the ARBA standard committee and the standard committee rejects your change, you're not gonna have any time to negotiate with them. You're not gonna have time to re-vote. You're not gonna have time to have that change reconsidered. <clears throat> the only opportunity you really have for that negotiation is if you get uh, your breed club, your members voted uh, real early and those changes submitted to the ARBA standard committee well before the deadlines. And I'm talking six months to a year before the deadlines. Um, it would take a resolution to change the constitution and bylaws to change those deadlines. Um, I mean, if I were in charge of the world, I would uh, do that because I think that would, um, would help breed clubs. Uh, there is a predictable amount of frustration um, that will occur in the fourth year of the standard if, uh, if there's no negotiation time uh, for changes. So go ahead, next stand. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't usually talk this much. The commercial first standard had a, a point change, uh, scheduled points. Uh, texture used to be 40 points and density 30. They're now 35 apiece. And there are also some language and grammar changes in the commercial fur description. But uh, in that description, there's no really intent to change anything substantive in terms of the kind of fur you're looking for. And I'll give you an example. Um, in the previous commercial first standard, uh, the, the word course was used a number of times. And they also described texture as a heavier, uh, thicker guard here. So um, this, the thinking on the part of the standard committee was that course is normally associated with a, a very harsh code, has a negative connotation, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, lustrous, you know, really luxuriant, uh, luxurious uh, commercial fur. So we went with the language that they had uh, around heavier, thicker guard hairs and dropped the word coarse. So those kind of language changes, but nothing substantive. The big deal is the, the density and texture are equal uh, in terms of change. And again, if you're a youth participant, that might come up as a question in a, in a contest. So go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me, general disqualifications. Um, these general disqualifications were reorganized, but not a lot of change in terms of, you know, what's in there in terms of the, the um, types of disqualifications or the, or the description of them. But if you're looking for uh, DQs that pertain to legs, uh, there, there should be a paragraph that everything that pertains to legs is in that paragraph. So that kind of reorganization. Um, there were two definitions in the previous uh, or two general DQs in the previous um, standard of perfection that allowed for um, protests and, the, and two of those removed to um, the type of DQ that you can't protest anymore. Uh, one was genitalia, the other one was shaded animals. So uh, going f under the current standard, if uh, the judge says your rabbit has a split penis, uh, you cannot um, uh, protest that uh, judgment decision. And the same with shaded animals. <coughs> Excuse me, there were two general DQs added. And again, this might pertain to contests, youth contests and so forth. Uh, pigeon breast was added uh, to the glossary. I encourage you to read that uh, definition. And then broken color, uh, Charlie and booted animals. Uh, or they're described in the glossary, but they're also now general disqualifications and they apply to every breed. And these are the examples of Charlie and Booted, with Charlie being on the top, Booted being on the bottom. So you can expect animals that um, have patterns or non-patterns that kind of look like those animals uh, to be disqualified from competition in the broken uh, groups uh, going forward. Uh, next. Um, there are a whole lot of judging and showing aids. And if you're new to rabbits, 
Um, there's a lot of really good information here in terms of body type profiles, how to pose rabbits, drawings of good and bad features in rabbits, uh, pictures, the broken picture examples I just showed you. There are pictures of malocclusion, um, a lot of breed color photos, really good examples of breeds. And also there are photos at the tail end of those colored photos on screw tail, split penis, white pads, uh, eye color, uh, acceptable eye color. So um, a lot of good information. If you're new to rabbits, um, certainly lots of good information just kind of in general. Uh, next. <coughs> oh, these are the only changes in those show, showing aids uh, that were made to that section. One was in the breed profiles, uh, the body type profiles um, are still described. There are now six of them instead of five of them. The one that was added was the high head mount group. And part of the thinking here is that, you know, Hollands and Jerseys and dwarves just don't look much like dwarves when you pose them. Um, they call for a very different kind of, kind of pose. And so uh, the committee thought that we needed a description for those breeds that didn't fit that body type profile. What was deleted from that section were the listing of breeds by body type profile. And part of the reason for that is that um, not all of the breeds fit all those descriptions very neatly. Um, and again, the high head mount um, animals just didn't seem to fit the compact group, uh, especially with regard to their pose, uh, their top line structure and so forth. So, um, so the listing of breeds under the profiles was eliminated, but the body type profiles remain. And then of course they added were the broken pictures of the Charlie and Bruder animals that we, that we just saw. So next slide. Okay, now we're gonna talk about specific breeds, <coughs> which is the bulk of, you know, uh, well, a lot of them changed. Um, this happens to be a picture of Ka uh, Judge Kyle Yakabuchi's um, a beautiful silver martin that won a group at the uh, Pennsylvania um, show in 2020. I had the privilege of handling the rabbit and choosing it for that group. And uh, I just thought it was a neat picture. So I wanted to share that with you. Next. The good news uh, when you're thinking about um, all breed changes and so forth is that there are a bunch of breeds that had no changes that are even worth talking about. And most of them had no changes at all. There are 25 breeds listed on this slide. So we have 50 breeds. So literally exactly half of the breeds in the air based standard of perfection had no change. So if you were really comfortable with the standards um, up for those breeds in the prior uh, standard of perfection, uh, the good news for you is uh, there's not a whole lot to look at for these breeds. The one exception of that is Harlequins. There's an error in the first printing of the, of the standard this, this time around, uh, and it's in the point section. It lists uh, color as five points and then proceeds to give a description, you know, a point breakdown that adds up to 15. And then there are 15 points on condition. That's backwards. So there should be five points on condition. 15 points on color. And uh, that should be changed in the in this next printing of the standard. And I my understanding is it's already changed in the electronic version of the standard. So there you go, the world of electronics. Um, so let's start looking at specific changes. <coughs> Excuse me. Americans um, um, now permit a small dewlap on senior does. Previously, that um, fault or that permission for a small dewlap applied to all three doe classes. So it's a little bit of a head scratcher, you know, from a judging standpoint. You know, what are you going to do with a junior that has a small dewlap? Just going to let it slide? Or hmm. anyway, um, it's permitted on senior does, and we'll see what happens uh, with that change over time for junior and intermediate does. Uh, they added a fault for dewlap on bucks. Um, they also added a fault for animals showing commercial type and blocky head. They simplified the blue color description and they added a fault for faded or uneven or rust color. So it's just a, a two or three changes. American Fuzzy Lofts uh, had a number of changes um, that, that will affect um, 
well, will affect youth contests for one thing, like weights changed, posing description changed, and so forth. Uh, but also, I think from a judging standpoint, this is a standard that um, needs to be reread by uh, all of us who think we know American Fuzzy Lots to make sure we understand the changes in their intent. They've added a tan pattern group since the last standard of perfection. They changed their weights. They moved, they removed the ideal weights. Uh, they moved up the maximum junior weights, a uh, quarter of a pound to three and three quarter pounds. And they decreased, or they, I'm sorry, they increased the minimum show weight to 1.14 pounds. So if you're using a, a regular scale, that's somewhere between one and three quarters and two pounds, kind of halfway between. Posing, they changed the description of posing. Um, I'm giving you a, a, a brief version of what those changes might look or do look like in the standard. I'd encourage you to read the section for the American uh, Fuzzy Lot posing section and really get a sense of um, kind of the nuanced changes that they made. Um, they seemed important to me. Type, uh, they added depth to approximate width um, that's an interesting addition. Uh, normally you see that addition on, or you see that language on commercial rabbits and commercial style rabbits. So maybe some compact rabbits that have a commercial style like Florida whites or mini satins or whatever. They're also talking now about a smooth hindquarters, slightly wider than the shoulder, and they changed their top line description just a bit. So again, I encourage you to read the um, fuzzy lap standard, especially the posing and uh, type section. Um, there's a minor um, shape description in the ears. <clears throat> they now talk about a flattened crown, so instead of a flat deer base. And of course, they have a, a broken um, group, and they're now subject to the universal broken group DQ. So next standard or next slide. Angoras uh, had a couple of minor changes. One is the satin angoras were added to the broken group. And it, boy, <laughs> um, as a member of the committee that looked at those for the two years uh, before they were approved, my gosh, they were good. They were really outstanding. Um, they've added a DQ in their uh, color guide for no discernible shading in the seal variety. And the French and satin angoras have a broken group and um, they now are subject to that universal broken uh, group disqualification. The hairs, um, some interesting changes in the hairs. And by the way, the picture is not a, it's from a, um, a show in the United Kingdom. So it's a European rabbit. And I just thought it was an interesting, interesting picture. That's the best of breed rabbit from the prestigious uh, Bradford show in 2020. I held uh, in, I think, Doncaster, which is north of uh, London. And it's also very similar to the, the drawing that was added to the Belgian Air Standard as a judging aid. So um, the drawing looks a lot like that picture. The Belgian hares prior to this standard simply had one variety. Uh, they were just called Belgian hares. Now they have uh, more than one variety. And so the original Belgian hares are now called the Rufus variety. Uh, the new group that was added is a tan pattern group. So that comes with four colors, black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. <clears throat> and um, I know that there are always questions of when a group gets added like um, to, to a breed like the Belgian hare and you've got a lilac you know, otter that you can show, but you don't have a kind of a lilac variety. Um, that's a fairly common practice. It goes back many years. Uh, there are a number of other breeds that um, have the same situation within their breed. Uh, the one that I'm most familiar with is a satin and mini satin a standard. And there's a lilac um, otter that you can show in big, sat in big satins, but, but there is no lilac variety. And that's true for all four of the groups in mini satins, uh, torts, um, silver martins, otters, and Siamese all have a lilac variety, but no um, lilac variety, but you can show a lilac Siamese, a lilac tort, etc. The ticking section for Belgian hares now is ticking and markings and they split up points. So there's like a couple of points in the triangle and so forth. Uh, it's important to read that section to see how they split out the points. Uh, they've added a dewlap and short body is false. 
They've had a drawing that, again, that looks a lot like this picture. There's an error in the first printing of the standard <clears throat> under Rufus Color Faults. Uh, it, it reads in the first printing that light bars are a fault um, that should actually read shadow bars are a fault. So the next slide. Britannia Petites had a number of changes. Um, they've added a Siamese sable variety since the last standard of, uh, of uh, perfection. Uh, they've got a broken uh, DQ. Um, and in the first printing of the standard, there's an error. Um, the old language for the broken DQ for Britannia Petites uh, is still in the first printing of the standard. So it's a ten, it reads like a 1050 disqualification. Now it's going to be um, changed in subsequent printings of the SOP. I believe it's already been changed in the electronic version. Um, you'll see um, an article by Briney uh, Smith, the uh, ARBA standard chair in the upcoming DR that points out this error. So the broken DQ is actually the universal um, booted um, or uh, Charlie broken as opposed to the 1050 that's printed in the first uh, printing of the standard. Uh, they clarified some head shape um, descriptions, um, faulting for small eyes. They added some clarifications on ears, no space uh, between ears, no flanges. Um, they fault for a lack of substance. So they're kind of looking for an ear now with a little more substance and structure to it. There were significant word and grammar changes in the Sable Martin descriptions, but the other colors uh, read pretty much the same as they always have. Uh, I think exactly the same as they always have. So next uh, slide. Dwarf photos, dwarf papillons in Havana's. Dwarf photos, they added the blue variety. They also added um, um, that they want medium bone. Um, that separates them from some other smaller rabbits that call for a, you know, a heavy bone relative to the size of the rabbit. And they also put some, I think, very good pictures of eye bands and ear substance. So you really get a sense of what you're looking for. Uh, if you're a breeder of door photos or a judge, um, uh, those uh, pictures are worth uh, checking out. They're, I think they're very good. We now have 50 breeds. The dwarf papillon is the 50th breed. They're currently approved in chocolate only, but that's going to change in pretty rapid order because all of the breed uh, certificates of development uh, are, now, are now converted to variety certificates of development. So literally in the next, at the next convention, you're gonna see, uh, I think a number of dwarf papillon varieties presented. They're currently CODs in black, blue, uh, lilac, tricolor, tortoise. And I'm sure there are many more to come. Uh, Havana's, <clears throat> A couple of minor changes, a lilac variety, of course, has been added uh, for some time. In fact, the convention that you, know, you see behind me is Indianapolis. I got the Judge Havana's there. Uh, the lilacs were gorgeous uh, at that convention. Uh, and they changed the broken um, group uh, DQ to the universal language, of course. So next slide. Moving right along. Jersey Willie's made a number of changes. This is a standard that I think uh, sh you should really pay attention to if you're a breeder of Jersey Woolies, uh, if you're going to be using one for showmanship and participating in contests, or if you're judging. I think there are a number of changes that uh, change the pose and change the look a little bit or the description of the look of Jersey Woolies. Um, they changed their description of their peak point. They introduced the term stifle, which means knee. That's where they want their animals to peak. Um, they added the description of the pose. I think that's um, important to read. They changed the wool point allocations. They still describe an ideal length, but they removed any points from it. And um, the emphasis is really on uh, texture and density. They added the points to texture and density. Uh, the ears are now uh, suggesting to us that we can, um, that a gentle V-shaped carriage uh, in the ear is okay. Uh, they still fault for a wide V carriage uh, for the ear. And they also fault for, uh, they added a severe fault for ears that are lying flat against the body. So unless you have a Jersey Woolly that's absolutely petrified or about to bite you, uh, which is a couple of reasons they might lay their ears down against their body, um, 
you probably have a structure fault. So uh, they're really talking about the ear set and getting it up on the head where it belongs uh, rather than laying down flat against the body. And um, they also have a broken group. So they um, added the universal broken disqualification language as well. Lion has made a bunch of changes. Um, sorry about the smaller print, uh, but they made a bunch of descriptive changes Keep in mind that the Lionheads are a very new breed. This is only the second time that the Lionhead Club has had an opportunity to change its standards since they were introduced. Uh, when um, when a, a new breed or variety is being um, introduced into the ARBA Standard Committee, the breed club doesn't own the standard. The presenter does. And then once, um, once the breed or variety is accepted by the ARBA, the owner of the standard becomes the ARBA. Uh, so the breed club really doesn't have much of an opportunity to weigh in on new varieties and stuff like that uh, until after the breed's accepted. So this is the on only the second time for Lionheads that the breed standard club has had a chance to weigh in on changes. And so often with new breeds, there are a number of changes when, that, uh, when breeds are coming new. So I'm not gonna read all the the new varieties to you just uh, for the sake of time here. But I am going to point out that they've added language that defines the top line. And I think it's important again for this breed to, to pay attention to this breed and read this breed if you're raising them, uh, read this standard. If you're judging them, raise the standard or read the standard because there are enough changes here that um, you don't want to get caught using the old language and, and, and so forth. One of the big changes is that they no longer talk about transition wool anymore. That's, transition wool has been replaced by um, face wool and flank wool uh, as descriptors at, in terms of the location of uh, where, the, where the wool changes to a normal fur. Um, and the wool, the man in the head, uh, they don't talk about a maximum length. They really want to emphasis on uniformity uniformity of length and density is the thing that's the most um, stressed in terms of, of the description. Um, they got rid of the term wool cap altogether for lionheads. Um, that was used by other breeds. The lionheads used it a little bit differently and that was confusing. I thought that was confusing. So they got rid of the term wool cap and just described the mane a little bit differently. Um, kind of incorporating what they meant by wool cap into the description of the mane. They also added a note that the only wool that should be evaluated for quality is the mane. So while they might have wool, you know, on the flanks and so forth, um, that is not to be considered, not to be evaluated uh, for quality wise in terms of placement. It's just there uh, and that's it. The, the, the quality of the wool that they want addressed is the main. On the head, um, there was, again, there was transition. Now there's face wool um, and they allow normal fur up to, uh, face wool or normal fur up to an inch long. They added a disqualification for face wool longer than an inch. There's an error under the main section. Uh, they, they referenced transition wool and a note there. Um, and my understanding is that that note, or the, at least the phrase transition wool is gonna be um, eliminated. I don't know if it's gonna be replaced by face wool or flank wool, um, but transition wool as a term is gonna be removed. They added a face and flank wool description. They added a reference to bib. We talked about that earlier in the glossary. Uh, so that's the chest wool under the main section. And they clarified the uh, separation of the main and the flank wool and they're asking judges to um, kind of show leniency to junior rabbits. Um, that's kind of one of those head scratcher changes. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to play out for the breed over time. You know how much leniency you're going to you're going to give a junior lion head. Uh, it either has a separation or it doesn't have a separation. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that the lean, the idea of um, leniency is applied to the breed over the next two or three years. Let's go to the next uh, slide. We're moving right along here, actually. Um, LOPS, uh, English and French, both had a number of changes. Um, English LOPS um, 
added more points to type. They uh, upped the emphasis on type from 35 points to 40 points. We don't judge by points, but what the points do is they give you a sense of what's important. So 40% of your evaluation for an English lab should now be on type. Um, and that's really what the points do. They reduce the ear points from 33 to 30. So now instead of having 11 points on length and width, substance and shape, texture and condition, it's 10 points a piece. And they increase the fur points from five to seven. So there's a little bit more emphasis on fur, more emphasis on type. All of the weights increased. And this, this is a big deal for judges, uh, for youths in contests and for breeders, I think. All of the weights were increased uh, except for senior does. So the minimum weights were increased for senior bucks and senior does. The maximum weights were in, I'm sorry, not senior does, just senior bucks. The um, minimum uh, weights were increased for both intermediate classes and the minimum weights were increased for both the junior classes. Um, there's an ear length change. <clears throat> And uh, they changed the ideal description from as long as possible to balance to the body. And, um, you know, I note some concern on uh, social media around that change. Um, you know, uh, we'll see over time uh, what impact that has on the breed. Um, I think it's too early to, really to predict one way or another. Uh, we're eight weeks into the current standard. It's a five-year standard. I think uh, in uh, a year, two, three years, we're going to have a, a sense of whether or not that change mattered uh, or impacted the breed in any way. Color. Um, both English and French labs now have separate color, color guides, and um, they used to be grouped uh, together. And uh, in addition, the mini laps were included in that color guide. So all three of those breeds, English lap, French lap, and mini lap now all have their own separate color guides. And that makes sense because if you're introducing a mini lap with a color that the other breeds uh, don't have, it's really kind of cumbersome to figure out how that fits into a combined color guide. It's also a little bit confusing. Uh, and one of the confusing things actually happened in the printing of the standard because pointed white, which is acceptable in mini labs, wound up in the color guides for both English and French, and neither of them have a pointed white um, group or variety allowed. So um, you'll see that's an error in the first printing, and you'll see that pointed white description eliminated from both the English and the French lab uh, color guides in the uh, subsequent printings of the, of the standard. French laps, weights were increased on the uh, intermediates. And again, there was an error in the uh, printing of the first standard. Mine's been corrected. So I bought my standard late enough to actually have a correction in it. And it's uh, like a taped in new um, weight um, description. So the correct weights are 12 and a half and 13 for intermediate bucks and does. Uh, points, uh, they removed uh, some points from the head and crown. And I see there's an extra word in that sentence, unfortunately. Um, but um, they now have a separate description for crown. Uh, interestingly, they didn't before and place some emphasis on it. So um, they added some points to the crown. A color, uh, same comments as the English laps. Um, uh, the air is the pointed white um, variety that's going to be removed from the color guide. And they have a separate color guide. So next slide. We're moving right along. I think there's only a couple more of these. <clears throat> Mini laps, uh, again, they have a separate color guide. Uh, in the last SOP, they were grouped with the English and the French. Uh, they have a universal uh, broken disqualification for their broken uh, group. Mini racks, the interesting change in mini racks is that they're going to be shown in groups, or currently should be being shown in groups. Um, they were previously shown by individual variety. So the groups are similar to the Jersey Woolly groups. There are six of them, so dissimilar from the dwarfs. Uh, and the dwarfs, the um, uh, broken um, uh, variety is, is in the uh, fifth group. Um, they were separated out um, in the mini Rex groupings as they are in the Jersey Woolly groupings. But mini Rex are judged like dwarfs, so you judge them first by variety and then by group. 
They've added the Sable variety since the last uh, standard perfection. I think they've got a couple of uh, CODs in the pipeline uh, for new varieties. And they have a broken variety of broken groups. So they have that universal DQ. Now the Lindorf's made very few changes um, for a breed with so many varieties. Um, they simply added a fault for woolly appearance of fur. And of course they have a broken um, variety too. So they changed that to the universal language for the broken disqualifications. Charlie and Booted uh, are both disqualified. Next standard or next, uh, there you go. Yeah, I think we have a couple more after this. I grouped mini satins and satins together because they made a similar change, similar color changes. Uh, mini satins have added four varieties since the last standard, so they're up to 16. They're probably headed to groups at some point. There is an error in the first printing of the standard. It lists the top junior weight as three and three quarter pounds. The correct top junior weight is four pounds. And again, that will be corrected in subsequent printings of the uh, SOP. Both um, the mini satin breed and the satin breed made um, the same changes. Uh, they're broken uh, the varieties, of course, are subject to the universal disqualification for Charlie and Booted. They both made the same change in their otter variety. Uh, they added a fault for a lack of proper belly under color, and that would be slate blue in the uh, blacks and the uh, chocolates, and kind of a dove gray in the uh, um, blues and lilacs. And they also changed very slightly their belly surface colors. So they're um, clarified that it's okay if they're creamy white in surface color, or if they're kind of a creamy orange for the blacks and the chocolates, or a creamy fawn for the blues and the lilacs. And again, the satins made those same color changes. So um, next slide. New Zealand's Polish and Rex. Uh, New Zealand's added uh, the blue variety since the last standard. They changed the universal uh, broken uh, disqualification for Charlie's and Booted's. And there's an error again in the first printing of the standard. The minimum weight for New Zealand's is six pounds, not the four and a half listed in the first printing of the standard. So six pounds um, is the minimum weight. And I, just a comment about the picture that is David Cardinal's. Uh, best in show New Zealand at uh, last time we had a convention in Del Mar, California. Just an absolutely gorgeous animal. Polish, uh, they've added the lilac variety since the last standard of perfection. Uh, recent addition, I might add, uh, just happened. Uh, and they changed their broken uh, DQ to the universal language. The Rex breed made four color changes. Um, the first one is in their Californian variety. They changed the point color description from black to sepia. That uh, puts them in, um, basically that makes them consistent with most of the other Himalayan um, color descriptions or Californian color descriptions, depending on which breed. Um, most of them describe sepia as opposed to black. The chin eye color changed to any color other than pink brown preferred. And that's, um, again, in keeping with many of the uh, chin breeds and varieties changed their language to that language in the last standard, uh, based on some research that a fellow by the name of Jack Etnard did uh, that linked um, superior chin color to, I think it was marble dyes, actually, which used to be a disqualification in some of the chin uh, breeds and varieties. Um, and he made the case and the standard committee accepted it. And so now they're accepting any color other than pink, brown preferred. They changed the description of their lynx variety. Um, they now, instead of disqualifying for a blue undercolor, uh, it's simply a fault and they have a broken variety. So they changed that to the universal language. So uh, next. Ryan Leiter, I think this is the last slide before we're, uh, we got a couple of slides after this, but they're real quick. Uh, the Ryan Leiter, uh, they changed their spine mar marking description and they also change, there's a change in their feet and leg description. Please read those. Uh, I couldn't figure out a way to make a real brief uh, description. They're kind of nuanced changes and uh, they're worth a read. There's an error in the, the first printing of the standard. The head marking section is completely omitted. Um, they, uh, and this is the language uh, that I printed here in this slide. 
that should appear in subsequent printings of the um, Standard of Perfection. Uh, again, given to me by Brandy Smith. I appreciate uh, her doing that. Silver, uh, points were added. So five points were added to type. Uh, 10 were added overall to body because they reduced points in other categories. They reduced color points by five. Uh, the reduction was all on evenness of silvering, uh, which is an interesting change given the description of the evenness of silvering and the emphasis on it. So we'll see how that plays out over time. Uh, they, um, under the DQ section, uh, they added uh, allow for pencil line and pencil line is described in the glossary. They added a DQ for a rollback coat. So now if you have a real soft coated uh, silver, uh, instead of that real snappy flyback, uh, those rabbits could be disqualified. They also added an interesting DQ for a complete absence of silvering. And I'm wondering why you'd call a rabbit that had a complete absence of silvering a silver at all, but um, I'm, whatever, we'll see how that plays out too. So next, uh, next slide. Oh, here, here's, um, here's where to get current information. Um, up-to-date information, sometimes literally from day to day uh, with regard to the standard of perfection. Domestic Rabbits Magazine, of course, um, there's an article every uh, edition from the standards chair, currently Brian e. Smith. Um, you can get information if you're a judge or registrar on the official um, ARBA judges and registrars uh, Facebook page. I think I left out the word Facebook there. Uh, so it's her Facebook page. Um, she's uh, printed a number of things that are um, uh, pertain to judging and uh, registering rabbits there. And the ARBA website, and I've checked that out a few times in the last week, and um, she's put a lot of, all the working standards are up, all of the new breed um, standards are up there. There's also one at the very end of that section that has all the working standards where you can print uh, all of those things in their uh, they're formatted in a way that when they print, you can kind of cut them off the page and, and they fit into your standard. So that's really helpful. You don't have to carry a bunch of paper around that doesn't fit into your standard. And uh, so there's lots of things that um, information that might change about the standard over time, new breeds, groups, and varieties, normally after a, an ARBA convention. Working standards literally now will show up, I think, on the website uh, as soon as they're approved. And that could happen anytime. Uh, new certificates of development are coming into the ARB standard committee all the time. And those are now being um, uh, noticed in that section of the website as well. So uh, last slide, and then we'll, we'll close her up. And this is a, just a repeat. And again, I just wanna remind you that I'm not the official spokesperson uh, and that the official information you can get is on the ARBA website, on the official judges and registrars Facebook page, Domestic Rabbits Magazine, and uh, certainly Bryony Smith, the chair of the ARBA Standard Committee, is, is the go-to person for information about the standard. And again, just thanking the people that, that provided information for, um, for this presentation, Kathy Shoulder, Bryony Smith, Sandra White, and her photography group. So, so that's it. Um, hopefully there was some helpful information in there for you. All righty. Thank you, Roger. Uh, this is a time I want to remind everybody, please uh, chime in where you're located. Also, any questions you have, just type them in and Amanda will uh, ask them in just a moment. Uh, one thing, Roger, I did want to ask you, I've got some questions on the new breed to Dwarf Papillon about okay. the body type. Would you mind just saying a few words about that, please? Yeah, well, I'm not the expert, but it's... Um, um, let me take a look at the breed profiles. You know, it's almost a cylindrical kind of animal. I'd have to read the, the type description, but it's a, the thing that strikes me about them and handling them is how sturdy they are, how much bone they have for a rabbit their size. And they're posed up a little bit. Um, I don't think you'd call them a high head mount group, but they're definitely posed up a little bit. Uh, they have a kind of a sloped top line. Um, the best ones are really round, um, mus you know, nicely muscled. They've got muscle and flesh that cover the skin real well, well filled at the base of the hind quarter. The, miking, the, the markings are really straight. Well, you're talking about tight mostly, I think so. Um, but anyway, 
I don't know if that's helpful. I'd read the type description. It's actually in the standard. It's amazing that they got it in there that fast, given that they were just approved um, like two months ago, three months ago. All right. Hey, thank you. Okay, Amanda, and what do you have there? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, depending which phone I'm looking at or which um, computer, like, so I've got a computer and a cell phone, and they're all lagging in different sections. Um, as far as check-ins go, I've got a lot. I've got... Um, here this phone shows me i've got lots of ohio's manitobas kentucky i saw arkansas um, michigan texas california west virginia nova scotia louisiana pennsylvania michigan oregon pennsylvania there was a um indonesia was in there there they're coming in from all over. <laughs> wow, hello to all those people. <laughs> Amanda, was the Oregon, was that the Mrs. Hassan <laughs> Um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a question that popped in, if I can find it again here. Um, was the points distribution changed for the Rylanders? Go ahead. That's a great question. I'd have to go back to the slide almost because my memory isn't that great. But I can look that up for you as we uh, as we speak. Is there another question while I'm doing that? Not at this time, but let me, if you give me one second here, I can get you back to your Rylanders. Okay. Um, I just got to flash through everything just because of the way. I don't have it in. Um, there we go. I got you up there. Okay. Well, they they did separate out feet and legs. Oh, I got uh, it on my screen. Sorry, I don't have it on your screen. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it's not my screen. <laughs> yeah, they Maybe did separate. They did separate out some feet and leg points. Um, they dropped a couple of points on color. All from distribution of color um markings they took a couple of points off of markings um the distribution is pretty much the same in terms of markings um so very minor uh point changes very minor point changes And it looks okay. like I got people more people chiming in from Kansas. Um, I had a New York chime in. And I'll, I will tell you the the um, presentation does does a uh, lag between my computer and my cell phone. So I don't know. <laughs> Hey, Amanda, is our Indonesia viewer, is that our one that we normally have? That is correct. Okay, can you give a shout out? Because I really appreciate them joining in here. Are you, are you where you can see their name? Yes, I can, but I'm not going to pronounce it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Well, we want to thank you for joining us across don't, the seas. Don't, don't, don't put me on the spot here. <laughs> sorry. But uh, thank you for joining us. We're glad to have you over there. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or chime-ins or anything, Amanda? At this time, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, well, let me uh, cover a couple of things and then maybe by then somebody else will come in with you. How's that? All right. <laughs> All righty. Uh, just want to remind everybody that uh, these uh, virtual sessions are recorded and they're added to our district's YouTube channel. And that's totally free. Uh, everyone's welcome there and just not District A, even just not ARBA. If you're interested in rabbits or cavies, it's free and feel free to take advantage of it. And the name of our YouTube channel is ARBA. D8 website. Again, ARBA D8 website. 
uh, give Amanda a few days and tonight's presentation will be added to that. Also, I do want to remind everybody in the last few issues of Domestic Rabbits, uh, you've seen some uh, proposed resolutions and that'll be out to the membership to vote on uh, here in a while. And uh, I think it's really good for the ARBA and of course for the members. Please uh, take your time and uh, check these out. And whether you wanna vote yes or whether you wanna vote no, please take the time and vote on these. Uh, it's important for everyone you know, to take advantage and uh, take part in this as much as uh, possible. Uh, Roger alluded to something else a little while ago and I'd like to go over that. I know our KV friends might be here and they're like, well, you covered the rabbits. What about the KVs? So guess what? Uh, March the 10th at 7 p.m. March the 10th at 7 p.m. We'll basically be doing a repeat of tonight, only this will be for the guinea pig side, the KV sides. And we're calling this Changes in the Standard of Perfection 2021 to 2025 KVs. And that'll be our good friend up in Ontario, Judge Mary Lou Eisel. And of course, Mary Lou is the current chair of the KV Standards Committee. So we went to the source on KV knowledge right there with Mary Lou, and she'll be doing on the 10th what Roger's doing for us uh, tonight. So I urge our KV people, and of course, rabbit people, everybody, please uh, take time and view this, and uh, hopefully we'll have an educational fun time as well. So Amanda, any more chime-ins or any more questions? Not at this time. <laughs> okay, Roger, was there any last minute things that you thought of? No, just hello to everybody. It's amazing that you, this reaches so many people literally all over the world. That's, that's really incredible. Appreciate, appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you. Uh, I think as we talked before, you know, we went on live, we started these at the shows in person and things changed. So now we went virtual. Uh, in some ways, I think it's helped us. You know, I like doing the live events in person, but you know, depending on the location, you couldn't always get the, the events uh, recorded and out there online where now we've got everything online and uh, putting it on YouTube. So uh, we're glad to be doing this. Eventually we hope to go back in person, but you know, for now we're doing virtual. And you know, I appreciate judges like Roger that have taken their time to speak with us. This is something you know not they don't have to do, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, goodwill on their part. And we definitely appreciate Roger uh, stepping up tonight and spending his time with us. And I want to thank uh, our person back at the control center, and that is Amanda Behe. She's one half of our District Eight web team. Uh, she does what we call these special projects and uh, events like this. Plus, she also handles our district's uh, Facebook page. Uh, the other half of the web team is Jane Burt in Michigan, and her duties fall primarily on uh, being our District 8 webmaster, as well as our newsletter newsletter editor, plus she also kicks out the flyers for these events, so uh, keep the web team pretty busy, and of course, thank you out there, everybody, for joining us. Uh, as we said, normally this is for District 8, but hey, it's open to everybody, so no matter where you're at. US, Canada, and beyond. We're glad to have you. So Amanda, before we sign off, anything else? Um, give me a second. A thousand one, a thousand oh, two. You guys keep talking for a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, and just to repeat, while Amanda told me to keep talking, again, March the 10th, 7 o'clock, Mary Lou Eisen will be doing the KV uh, changes to the standard. Uh, we're still working on some other events. I've got another one already scheduled, but it was a little farther out, so we're probably going to announce it here in just another week or two. Uh, those, these are strange times, of course, but uh, we're working on more, and we do have another in schedule. So, Amanda, did I give you enough time? Um, sort of. Uh, you have somebody was wanting to know if they could have a printout of the slide. A printout of the PowerPoint. Okay. Well, that would be. I would recommend just going on the YouTube because uh, I mean that's really uh, R R Roger's PowerPoint right there. So. Uh, 
you know, right now the YouTube, uh, maybe we can work something else out there. Hope that's an answer. Yes, I'm having some log, um, issues on my laptop right this second. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question that was asked, um, and I'm going to just refer that back to contacting the district director, um, since I'm not able to comment right this second. Um, your district director should be able to answer your question. But um, if you guys have, I do not have any other questions at this time. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to you, which you're still on the screen. Okay, any other chime-ins with locations? Um, we just have a lot of thank yous happening. Well, um, your welcomes. Yeah, lots, lots, lots of welcomes. You guys will see it all. <laughs> okay, so that's... You, you pretty much covered it all. And actually, I watched this presentation one other time. And I continue to learn stuff. So you guys can, if you watch it more, like if you go back and watch it again, it's kind of like a movie. You kind of like pick up on things that you didn't pick up on before. Was the acting better or worse this time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You're still in the same spot. Yeah, that's true. I haven't <laughs> left Indianapolis. I know, right? You're, you're here in District 8. Oh, so, so, Roger, you're a member of District 8 now. Uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Amanda, nothing else then, correct? That is correct. <laughs> okay, Roger, again, that was really groov groovy of you joining us. So, again, thank you. Uh, sure. Amanda, Amanda uh, Jane, our people out there, please remember to come back March 10th, and we've also got something else we'll be announcing very, very soon. So stay safe, my friends, and see you soon. Bye-bye. Just a minute. Hang on a second. Thank you.